Hello and welcome to this month's edition of Field Notes. I'm your host, Jeff Weisenberger. This month, our guest is Giselle Santos Rivera, a Vice President and Senior Medical Planner with HKS's Washington, D.C. office, and also the company's Global Director of Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, which when you uh, put it all together, it makes one of the best acronyms I've ever heard for a job title. Um, Welcome, Giselle. Well, hello. This is great to be here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to start off and uh, get a little bit of your background. Can you tell us a little bit about where you're from and you know, where you where you studied architecture? Yes, absolutely. So I'm originally from Puerto Rico, a born and raised there. I, I went to undergraduate school at the University of Puerto Rico and the Rio Piedras campus. And I actually started studying genetics. And it was through the encouragement of my geology professor that I ended up transitioning to architecture. So in the six years that I was there in uh, doing an undergraduate degree, I was doing genetics alongside environmental design. And while I was doing environmental design, my one of my professors told me that I could do a master's in architecture without finishing my undergraduate degree in environmental design. So I kind of skipped that and went to Syracuse University to do my master's in architecture. Okay. Oh, excellent. So what at what point did this professor say, you know, oh, you're in genetics. You should also think about architecture. I'm just curious how that came up. It's a, well, it's an interesting story. It's definitely not linear like anything in my life. So I, w- I was studying genetics and I was working in a lab and I really did not like working in a lab. The The buildings in Puerto Rico were built by people that really didn't understand the context and the tropical nature of our buildings. So I, the, I was working in a studio and in a laboratory that was closed off to anything in the exterior world. There was no light coming in the spaces. All the offices were on the perimeter. And I would spend hours, hours working on, um, on, on these projects. And I just really didn't like it. And so I ended up doing or coursing other, other things that, that were available for me in, in, in architecture and in the humanities and, um, and, and started doing painting. I started taking courses in geology and physics and I was doing installations in galleries in Puerto Rico and my geology professor just happened to have been invited to one of my gallery exhibits and I was doing an installation and it was very interesting. It was about voyeurism, but it was about space and at the end of the installation, he just said, have you ever thought of doing architecture? It seems like you're really good in spatial arrangements. You're interesting about, interested in, in these topics. I was doing other work in, in, the, in the art school. And when I was growing up, my mother and father were convinced that I was going to become an architect because I would destroy the house with cushions and blankets, making spaceships and towns and cities for my little brother. I just didn't see myself studying architecture because growing up, I thought all they did was models. And I thought, well, I did that already growing up and I was interested in genetics. But it, you know, as fate would have it, and my geology professor said, you should, you should take the summer course. It's really interesting. Um, you have to apply for it anyway. So I did the summer program and lo and behold, I fell in love with building models. So I ended up in architecture school anyway. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Um, well, it's funny, you know, one of the questions I, I was going to ask, and I still will, is just one, you know, one of, about one of your favorite buildings that sort of influenced you. It sounds like in your case, I mean, like you said, you had this nonlinear path, but you were also driven to it a little bit because you you were in a building that wasn't ideal for its purpose um, in the lab, um, not taking advantage of natural light and all that sort of thing. Growing up, were there certain buildings that you were sort of influenced by? Well, I think it's really interesting. I've always been more intrigued about spatial relationships okay. and the impact that the overall built environment can have. So I always say to me, architecture is so much more than just buildings. It's sort of the mm-hmm. state that we that we live our lives in, right? It's the backdrop to, to everything, everything that we do in our life, to all of our experiences. So I, I've always been intrigued by, by the impact that the buildings can have on how you experience your life, um, your relationships, and all of these things. It's really funny. When I'm, you've probably heard that from other architects, but I loved Epcot Center, for example, growing up. I was, I was fascinated by, by the thought that you could kind of recreate culture in in a, in a spatial way, and you could traverse 
through Epcot Center, through all of these sort of these venues. You could go to Mexico and Sweden. And that for some reason that always resonated with me. And when I was thinking about architecture, I always I always correlated architecture with culture. So how do you understand a culture by understanding the built environment? My parents were always fascinated with Europe and Puerto Rico. We didn't have we we do have colonial buildings from from the Spanish colonial era, but going to going to Europe and seeing seeing th these Gothic spaces and these villages and and seeing these these urban centers being framed by all this culture was really fascinating. But funny enough, when I think of my favorite building, it really has nothing to do with <laughs> any of it. I always think of Barragan, that the Mexican architect. And okay. I, I had a, an opportunity to do a summer program in Mexico. We visited his house, the, the house that, that he built for himself. And the things that fascinated me the most were little things like he would put soap, uh, those uh, ceramic soap, dis not dispensers, but what holds the soap, it it's just becomes like this ledge in the mm -hmm. tile pattern. But he would okay. put not one, but four, so that the intersection and the grout pattern of all these soap dishes would make a cross, so that he would be constantly reminded about his connection to to religion. And I remember when we walked into his into his kitchen, his kitchen, his dining table was right up against the wall so that nobody could sit at one head of the table. And the on the others on the opposite side of the kitchen, the 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 wall was painted gold. So he would always sit at the head of the table. And when people would look at him, he would be against this golden backdrop, like more like holier than that. And to <laughs> me, the impact. Right, the the power that architecture can have on experiences, on how you want to see yourself if you are the architect. I always thought it was so fascinating from the micro, from creating a cross with soap dishes in a ceramic towel pattern against the wall, to to cities, to walking on cobblestones, to widened widened sidewalks so that you could have conversations. To me, it's sort of all of these things put together always fascinated me. Yeah, now I'm thinking, do I need a gold wall at my house? Um, I don't think I'd be able to get away with that. Um, I think we all do. I think we all need gold walls. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, as far as your own projects, uh, maybe maybe tell me one or two of your more memorable ones, either with HKS or elsewhere. And 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 when I say memorable, um, you know, interpret that as you like, something that you're proud of or something that you're like, wow, that was great. I never want to do a one like this again. Well, I, I can definitely say that that is how I was thinking memorable. But but in part, I think it's one of the reasons that I gravitated towards this role of, of director of JEDI, of Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Um, mm -hmm. When I was working in a previous firm, we were doing um, a county, a Justice County Center in Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And I remember we were working on this project. It was the first time that I was doing um, a jail. So I... As with anything that you don't understand really well, I didn't have hesitations because I, I knew it was just, it was a job that I needed to do. But I jumped in to, to do the work because I was interested, I've always been interested in in buildings that have a very unique function so that you really have to think about who who uses it, why they use it, how they traverse to the space, through the space. Uh, so I, I, was, I was very intrigued, although, uh, concerned about you know what it means to really design these things, but I remember we were working on this project, and it it was a a P three project, and I remember having a debate on whether we we needed to have openings the size of the openings for all the the cells, and I remember thinking that what an impact an architect can have in these kinds of conversations if you if you really want to think of these spaces as, as as human spaces that provide dignity, for regardless of their function, you know, you, you really have to think about the human being. How could we not think about their experience within these spaces, even mm -hmm. if they're there for only three hundred and sixty five days? So that that really changed me and how I thought about architecture and the impact that we can have and the decisions that we make when we are working on projects like these or any project. And the impact that we can have on the lives of somebody, whether 
whether transient, whether they're just visiting a space or whether they're there for, for a long time. Um, so in, in part, I think that's why I wanted to transition into healthcare and thinking of buildings in a way that they could heal and they could help somebody um, heal through, through, through a disease or, or provide them with some kind of wellness in, in the time that they experience that, that space. Mm -hmm. And my parents are both in, in healthcare. My mother's a, a dentist and, and my dad is a hospital administrator. So I always had that in the back of my mind, but I had never envisioned the impact that I could have as an architect in the well being of someone that is a patient and the mm -hmm. impact that, that can have on, on the clinician, on the person that's giving the care, on the family members that they're taking care of somebody. So I think memorable, I would say it's the experiences like those that remind me of the power that decisions can have in how a building is put together. When did you start seeing the topic, you know, justice, equity, um, diversity and inclusion? When, when, when did you see this becoming like a regular topic of a discussion. I mean, obviously it's, they've always been, those issues have always been there, but they've obviously not been recognized the way they should be. But when did you th see it like become like, okay, this is something that we're talking about on a regular basis, or are we still not there yet? Uh, that is a really good question. And I think it varies degrees of, uh, I guess, in proximity to the topic. I think because I've been interested in the topic, for, for a long time because of the way that I see myself within the architecture profession. I think I've always acknowledged the terminology in some form or fashion, but formally for me, the, the moment that it became a part of how I saw architecture um, was probably around 2004, 2015, when I started reading about the equity by design a group in San Francisco, in AI San Francisco, and their missing 32% survey that transitioned now into the equity by design survey. And it's, it's kind of a movement that exists now within the architecture profession. And they, for me, they started to provide a lot of the language of equity, diversity, inclusion, and what it means to be a minority and a woman in the profession. And why at that time, why we were seeing 32% of of women and minorities drop off of the profession. And when I was starting to read the documentation and, and read their research, it started to become my own language as well. So when I was in, in the AIA DC chapter and then when I joined the AIA through the National Associates Committee, I, I then had language to talk about the issues that I was interested in. Like what does the future of the profession look like? Um, why, why do we need to consider emerging professionals when we're looking at the future of our, of our industry? What does it mean to be a woman within the industry? What does it mean to be Latina? What does it mean to be queer in the industry? And I, I think it's been consistently for me for about five years that I, I recognize the language, but I can see it more prevalent now, probably within my firm, because we were, we were having conversations around being better together, which was a part of what we did, um, an initiative that we put together in our firm. And I started, I started seeing more the, the, the role of the chief diversity officer being embedded within the C-suites in a lot of organizations outside and inside of architecture. And I started connecting all of those dots. And formally in 2018, in the strategic planning process for my firm, that's when they started solidifying equity, diversity, and inclusion in support of the UN Global Compact. Mm -hmm. So if, if you start layering all these conversations, I think for me it was, I started getting more interested in what it means to have that mm -hmm. kind of language in a profession. Then I started sort of seeing it everywhere in the UN Global Compact, in the Sustainable Development Goals, I started seeing in the profession, I started seeing in the Me Too movement. And I think now because of Black Lives Matter and the death of George Floyd, I think now the language starts to include justice. And now the, the, the even the terminology of Jedi is becoming now more of a common language around any firm, whether, whether it's sort of on the periphery or whether it's starting to become embedded in how we do business. 
because even our clients are asking for it. They're asking, how are you partnering with minority owned businesses? Are you partnering? Um, do you have a statement around equity, diversity, and inclusion? Um, what does that look like in your hiring process? What does that look like in, in your website? How are you promoting it? So I think it's, it's a process and it's layered. And I think if the more that you are aware of those words, the more you start seeing them out there, but it's been there a while. What do you think is the best way for firms, you know, architecture firms and just construction um, related um, companies in general to, to approach the topic? I would say that the best way to do it is to acknowledge that Jedi is a lens that we view the world through. It's mm -hmm. not sort of an initiative or a topic. It's just a different way of looking at our business and every aspect of our business. So it is not only our recruiting, our retention, it's the future of our of our projects, it's the future of our organizations, and it's about resiliency. Sure. And I think the reason the topic gets broken down into pieces is because it's hard to digest what it means holistically. So mm -hmm. I always start to talk about, okay, let's let's break down the words. And if you talk about justice, if you think about a business and you think about justice, you really want to think about resiliency. Like if you're if you're creating a building, if you're creating something, you think about sustainability. Mm -hmm. You think about okay, so how do I how do I think about materiality? How do I think about water, energy? So how all we're doing when we talk about Jedi is okay, so how does this impact the community that it's in in a way that it provides a just and equitable access to resources? Mm -hmm. So if we if we start bringing it as a topic, much like we bring sustainability into the conversation, when we talk about environmental and and health and human health and human um, rights, then we can we can think a bit holistically. If we want to break it down into pieces, then we can we can think about the equity that we're building in our firms to create a better um, a better space for inclusion. In, in the practices that we create. But I think if we think about at the core what it means, um, we're, we're just wanted to, we, we just wanna create belonging and respect for, for everybody that we interact with on our day-to-day -day basis. So we wanna be better people, we wanna be better leaders, we wanna be better clients, we wanna be better partners. And if you look at that through the lens of who you are and what you bring to the table, then you bring the topic as an individual and if we think about it as a collective, then we start thinking about it as how we how we work together to create this in our deliverables and in our projects and ultimately in our communities. So it's a really layered conversation. And I think it depends on on your comfort level of bringing those topics and that terminology to the table and also how you see resiliency within your firm and the future of your organization. Can you tell me a little bit about the job, <laughs> about your role? I'm, are you you're a practicing designer still? And then, or how does that all work? At the beginning, when I was asked to take on this role, thankfully my firm gave me the opportunity to really craft it how I saw it be most beneficial for me and for the firm. So at, at the beginning, uh, we had we had, I guess, come to the decision that I was going to allocate fifty percent of my time to defining this role within my firm, and then fifty percent of my time to being a medical planner. Okay. So I, I in the first year, because I've been on this role for almost two years, the first year I was trying to understand, first of all, my own bandwidth, what it what it meant to do these two things at the same time. Uh, what this role really wanted to be and the kind of impact that I thought this role and, and I wanted to have on, on my firm and also in the industry. Because my role, I was the third person to take on this role and have formally this role in, in the architecture profession as I, as I understood it, uh, formally defined as a role with a percentage of time allocated to it. So it took me about a year to, to come up with a strategy of what is what it was going to mean for HKS, how it was going to define the pillars for the role, and and quickly I I, I had to recognize that this role is not only me, but it it takes a whole group of people, and and people with with agency to 
to create content and do things to take ownership of some of that content. So I, I started breaking it down into pillars and creating a structure. And then COVID hit the world and then Black Lives Matter and, and the death of George Floyd. And when that happened, I started to realize um, I need to pretty take this on head first. And now this is 20% of 200% of my time, I should say. Um, this is pretty much 200% of my time um, and about a thousand percent of my emotional <laughs> coefficient of life. Uh, if that's the thing, it, this is, I, I'm very vested in, in what it means to create belonging for, for everybody in my firm, uh, what it means to design for dignity and, and design with everybody in mind. And I'm, I'm also very interested in what it means to have somebody like me or somebody that focuses on this in, in a role in a, prof in, in a firm for the profession. So I, I take on a lot and that, that's sort of my, my calling and what I've chosen. I hope that in the future I can transition back and I can definitely see that happening because I'm, I'm creating a structure that creates more accountability throughout the firm. But mm -hmm. if anybody has read sort of the first article that I wrote when I took on, took on this role, and I, I recognize that it's very blue sky. I do hope that my role doesn't exist formally in 10 years because it's divided throughout the firm and people own pieces of this and this just becomes embedded in how we do business. How, how did you end up in Washington, D.C.? And then can you maybe tell me a little bit about what you enjoy the most about it? Sure. So I, um, like I said, like I sort of mentioned before, I, I did my undergraduate in Puerto Rico. I was encouraged to pursue my graduate degree in in the States. My mother always told me that she thought that it was very important for me to to learn about uh, other other places in the world and other cultures. So she always encouraged me to do my master's outside of Puerto Rico with the hope that I would come back with new and heightened awareness of the world. I just never made it back. But <laughs> I, I went to school. I did my graduate school in, in Syracuse University. I thought it was closer to New York. Um, it was not, and I did not know that going from the beach to negative 45 weather and 180 inches of snow would be just the most horrific experience that I would ever have. But I loved, I loved um, Syracuse University. Um, so the the Syracuse University graduate program and the undergraduate program, they have a great career fair. So I, I stayed for the career fair, and I had the opportunity to meet many, many practitioners around the East Coast and some in the West Coast. And I got I got great offers from New York, um, New Jersey, Princeton, and DC. And my aunt lives in DC. Okay. So when I, when I was choosing where, where to start my practice um, and where to, where to start architecture, I thought, I was between New York, because I love Broadway, and DC, mm -hmm. but being having family around sort of trumped everything else. So I, I've been in DC for about 16 years. And things that I love about these DC, which are, uh, you, you, could, you could take it as a positive and a negative. I kind of love that it is, it's somewhat of a transient city, which makes it very hard to make friends, sure. but it makes it very easy to meet and constantly meet different people, hear different perspectives, um, good or bad. It's also kind of the center of politics. So um, understanding, um, that you hear varying uh, opposing views consistently about, mm -hmm. about politics or even the world it makes me feel like I'm very present in conversations. And I love that. I love listening to, to different perspectives constantly and being bombarded with very passionate views about things. Sure. Um, and I, I love that it's very, it's very culturally diverse. So I've never, I've never felt like the other. I've always felt like I'm very much of otherness because everybody's kind of the same. And I, I, I really thrive on that. And I, I thrive on, on the opportunities that it can afford. I, I think, I, I really feel like here you can really do anything that you want to do because you, there's every, everything happens in DC. And you have the opportunity to meet and see anything. So if you really want to do something, you just have to find it. And it's really easy to find. Um, so I can't imagine being anywhere else at the moment. <laughs>